Hey everyone, I am here to do a video for you today um, about my work as a cultural anthropologist and this will also be a introduction to cultural anthropology. We've talked a little bit about what cultural anthropology is. I know I have at least one student in this class who's in my intro to cultural anthropology class, so uh, you will have seen some of this stuff, but not all of it. Um, so I've entitled this video, uh, What is Cultural Anthropology? and how have I used it as a researcher, practitioner, and activist. Um, by the way, I'm using a new version or a new mechanism for how to record this in hopes that the video won't freeze up uh, as it does with QuickTime and Photo Booth and all that stuff. I'm recording directly to iMovie, so fingers crossed. And I'm gonna try not to go too long because there's so much stuff to go over in this video. So. What is work as a cultural anthropologist? What do cultural anthropologists do? Well, uh, as I often tell people, I hang out. Uh, it's what we call participant observation. Our main method is cultural anthropologists. So cultural anthropologists hang out in homes and communities and sites all over the world. We study people's everyday lives by participating with and observing them as they do what they do. Then we ask them about what they think, what they do, what they feel, and why they think, do, and feel those things, right? In context. By doing this, we can bridge divides between different kinds of people belonging to different communities, cultures, countries. That's their job. We're cultural translators, basically. So in short, we explore, explain, and communicate social and cultural diversity for both academic and applied projects and reasons. And obviously in this course, we want to give you a sense of all you can do with an anthropology degree, including anth cultural anthropology, outside of just being a researcher or a professor. Of course, there are all sorts of people who do research uh, that are not professors. So cultural anthropology, uh, obviously the key term in there, aside from anthropology, is culture. This is my definition of culture. Um, group relative ways of thinking, perceiving, acting, and feeling. So thinking everything that's going through your mind, all those th processes of cognition, you learn those as members of a certain culture, a certain community, a certain group. What you actually see, perceive with your senses, uh, what you hear, what you taste, that too is formed by your culture. Acting, what you do, all the things you do in your life, the ways you hold your body, what you do in the world, that too is formed by the culture, the group, the community you're a member of, and feeling. Emotion, too, is culturally formed, culturally mediated by the kind of community uh, you are born into, your primary culture, or all those subcultures, those secondary cultures that you become part of later in life. So culture, all those groups have ways of thinking, perceiving, acting, and feeling, and you are socialized or enculturated into them as members of those communities. So this is what we study as cultural anthropologists. How do we study it? Through participant observation field work, through interviewing and some other techniques that I'll talk about briefly. So the point of this presentation is to tell you what we do, tell you how we do it, and then to tell you what I do, not academically so much, um, that's all my other classes, I'm gonna tell you about what I do that's not really academic in terms of cultural anthropology. We've talked about that applied, uh, practical uh, anthropology or activist anthropology. An important term and concept for cultural anthropology is cultural relativism. When people take my intro to cultural anthropology class, this is one of those big concepts I want to stick with them well after they get out of the uh, class at the end of the semester. So the central lesson of cultural relativism, all of us, the culture we're born into, it's just one culture among many, among thousands of cultures around the world. Um, so our ways, uh, are, meaning you know you and me and the culture we're born into whether you consider your primary culture to be North American you know US or something else you know our ways of perceiving thinking acting and feeling those are just one possibility amongst thousands that exist today in the world um, so being a relativist a cultural relativist allows you to be more empathetic more critical, more critically minded, um, more self-aware and more creative. Uh, when you're a relativist, you can be a better scholar and you can be a better citizen no matter what you do. So 
being a cultural relativist, being aware of all those different ways to be a human being out there, all the different ways in which we're enculturated or socialized, does not mean that you know you think anything goes in the world, right? There's no useful sense of good and bad, or there's no absolute uh, truth and falsity, or uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, good and evil in the world uh, that can be applied across cultures. You know, we're not that kind of just all up in the air because. You know, if you're born into one culture, there's your true and false. There's your good and evil. You know, members of another culture, uh, they have their own sense of true and false and good and evil. We're typically not like that. It's hard to live like that as a human being, to be an absolute relativist. But if you're a cultural anthropologist, what we ask you to be is what I call a methodological relativist. So before you think you can understand or let alone judge the actions of members of a different culture, You've got to do all you can, humanly possible, to understand what those actions mean to members of that culture itself from their perspective, in their terms, not what those actions mean in terms of your own culture, right? Uh, people do, you know, I teach a book about cannibalism in my introduction uh, to cultural anthropology class. As a, somebody who grew up in the United States, as a Euro-American, I have my own sense of what cannibalism is. I shouldn't apply that to members of that culture. I want to understand what it means to them and uh, how it makes sense to them uh, before you can even say whether it's morally or ethically good or bad, right? So your point is to try as hard as you can to see things from the cultural perspectives of members of different uh, of a different culture. That's the point of the game. Um, and you go into this assumption as a cultural anthropologist that Pretty much everybody in the world, no matter how different they are from you, probably thinks they're living a pretty good, decent, moral life. Uh, they may fail in terms of the standards of their own culture to live a moral life, but they have their sense. They go to bed at night thinking, yeah, my way of doing things is a pretty good way of things. So the important point of being a cultural anthropologist is to understand what makes them feel that way. What are the meanings or logics that allow them to think that their way of doing things is a good, natural way of doing things, right? How do they view their culture, right? Their ways of speaking, thinking, acting, and feeling, perceiving from their own perspective. So we try to understand people from their own perspective. Our job is to be maximally aware of cultural diversity. Uh, that's what cultural anthropologists are good at, to try to be empathetic, see things from the, uh, from the inside um, perspectives of members of communities that are not our own. Now, how do we do that? As I said before, um, participant observation research. Uh, people say, Mike, what do you do when you go down to Ecuador? I say, hang out. <laughs> I do exactly what people do. I sleep in their houses, I eat with them, I talk with them, I go hunting with them, I drink hallucinogenic drugs with them, uh, but I do that for a reason. It's deep hanging out. You really try to immerse yourself. Um, by doing this, we do uh, what cultural anthropologists call ethnography. Ethnography is both a process or a method and a product. So what does this word ethnography mean? You, let's say break it up. An ethno means a community or group, like an ethnic group. And a graphy means like a portrait of a community, a culture, or an ethnic group. So an ethnography is a portrait or description of a human community or group. And ethnographers or cultural anthropologists are the people who do and write ethnographies. You could write an ethnography of Kofan people, uh, which is a lot of what I do, but you can write ethnographies of university professors, you can write ethnographies of gamers, you can write ethnographies of anything. Any culture, any group has some probably shared way of doing and thinking things, and uh, if you want to understand them and write about them, you write an ethnographic account. So there's five central qualities of participant observation research, and this is my own uh, little list, but it's a it's a pretty good one, I think. Um, to do uh, participant observation, you have to embed or immerse yourself in the community you're trying to understand to the best of your abilities. It could be 24 seven, like I do. If you're studying university professors, you know, you're probably not gonna go live in their house with them and wake up with them and go to bed with them, but you're gonna try to spend as much time in the everyday context of their lives as possible. 
Participant observation research often also takes a long time to understand, to immerse yourself, to participate in another group's way of life. Uh, it's, it's a long-term project. That might just mean a few weeks, uh, let's say rather than one interview for somebody who's not an ethnographer or a cultural anthropologist, it might mean a year or two years. Um, participant observation is holistic. We try to understand everything about that community. We often don't you know, realize how religion is tied to kinship, is tied to economy. So we try to understand everything because if you have a very fixed topic that's often informed by your own culture and not the culture of the people you're trying to study. So pay attention to everything because connections are always there and you're not going to be aware of them until you've done your research. That's tied into a fourth quality of participant observation research, which is that it's open-ended. Um, if you don't understand or know anything about this other community or culture, you might not even know like what the really important questions or concerns are until you've started to learn about that uh, other community or culture. I'm taking off my socks. It's really hot in my, uh, my office slash bedroom right now. So you got to be really open, open-ended and open-minded about what you're studying and let kind of certain topics organically emerge as you're doing research. Finally, it is empirical. We study things that actually exist, but our research is largely qualitative. Um, we don't, uh, as cultural anthropologists, typically we don't do a lot of statistical work, a lot, not a lot of numerical work. Uh, we're qualitative, not quantitative researchers, although there's plenty of cultural anthropologists who do use a lot of quantitative techniques in their work. But on the whole, participant observation and interviewing, it's qualitative. But as I said before, we're studying things that exist independently of our perceptions of them. We're trying to give accurate accounts of them. So in my mind, cultural anthropologists really are scientists. Uh, some people might not agree with that, but that's my perspective. So the steps of participant observation research, what cultural anthropologists do. Well, first, you got to get access to your community. Find your field site and get permission to work there. Uh, if you're working for a corporation and they want to study, um, let's say, they're in inter their internal corporate culture, uh, you got to get permission you know, from the CEO to work with the CEOs, to work with the middle managers, to work with the marketers, to work with the... The people out on the factory floor. So you got to get access to a site and you got to get permission. You can't do anything without the consent of the people you're working with, especially with participant observation because you're getting so close to people, right? If you didn't have their permission, they didn't know what you were doing, you'd be a spy. You would be a cultural anthropologist. Socialization. Slowly, uh, as you're starting to immerse yourself in the lives of that community, um, you're going to learn how to perform their norms, their cultural traditions, their jargon, their language, everything. You actually try to kind of embody and learn what you're trying to know or understand. You try to make it part of yourself. You try to uh, be able to participate and perform that culture as people who live there uh, do it themselves. That takes a lot of developing very close relationships. Uh, you get close to people. It can be a very intimate form of research or science. It's one of the reasons why some people say, hey, this is way too close, way too subjective, way too biased, because you're not keeping that scientific distance uh, from your object of study. Um, well, it is true that you get really close uh, and intimacy is part of it, but that's how we get to understand people really, really well. You need to develop those relationships. Slowly, you'll find people that become key research consultants for you, people who can explain things really well, people who trust you a lot, people who really welcome you into your lives. So even though you have these key research consultants, you try to familiarize yourself uh, and become close to as many people in that community as possible. As you're doing all of this, you're taking a lot of field notes, right? From the first day you're in this new community, uh, you're writing down everything you see, everything you feel. Uh, being a participant observation researcher is also writing constantly. I've got a new article coming out in a book just, it's called like Naked Field Notes or something. And it's just about giving like a really uh, iconic field note from your current project and then writing an essay about what that field note contains, what it doesn't contain, how you produced it, all of this stuff. Um, so when you're observing and participating, you're constantly taking notes on everything you see, everything you do, everything people say. Um, 
And gradually you'll start to do interviews as well. You'll figure out what's important, what the focus of your study is, and you don't just want to participate. You want to take people aside, get your recorder out and say, hey, I've got some really set questions for you. I've learned these things about your community, but I want to really do a focused uh, question and answer session. And you typically record that and that provides really, really valuable data. Um, so that's essential to cultural anthropology, doing interviews with people. Um, but a lot of different disciplines do interviews. Uh, the hallmark of cultural anthropology is that participant observation research, right? Observing, participating. Finally, uh, a step to participant observation research is ending your project, having an exit strategy. Um, and certain uh, kinds of projects, you know, they're going to just be a week or two or a month or two. Um, even though I do separate projects, I have no exit strategy uh, for my larger relationship with the co-fund nation. It is a lifelong one. Um, so I intend to, to be there until I no longer physically can be. Uh, but every project I do is going to have a beginning and an end, and that's got to be communicated to people too and negotiated. Um, you know, sometimes it's modified as you're doing your project because it might take an extra year or field season to figure out what you're going to do. But yeah, you not only have to begin a project, you have to end it. Observing and participating, just to go over this a little bit more, as I said a second ago, you watch everything. You try to pay attention to everything, right? It's holistic, it's open ended. Gradually become more focused on what your topic of interest is. Participate in as many activities as possible. When I went in and started doing research with co-fund people, I didn't drink alcohol, certainly didn't take hallucinogenic drugs, was a hardcore vegetarian, but I needed to hunt. I needed to eat meat if I wanted to learn uh, how co-fond people live and uh, let them know that I respect and, and, and approve, quote unquote, of their culture. But try to figure out what it is, you got to really jump in. Uh, you try to go to the same spaces at different times because different things are going to be happening there, right? Um, your main instrument as a participant observation, re observation researcher, uh, as a cultural anthropologist, is actually your body, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your notebook. Um, you are using all of your sensory capacities to learn about this other community uh, in the most, as I said, encompassing, comprehensive, holistic way possible. So your body and your senses are extremely important to you as a cultural anthropologist. Field notes, no matter whether you want to or not, you got to take them. Because you think you might not forget, you might uh, uh, might not forget something. You're going to remember everything. That's definitely not the case. Uh, write down everything in as much detail as you can. Everything you see, everything that seems significant that somebody says. So write it as often as you can, as soon as you can, uh, as many times as you can. In the beginning, when you don't know anything about this community, everything is going to seem new. It's going to seem relevant and rich. Pretty soon, you're going to start to get used to th things. They're going to become habitual for you and you're not even going to think about them anymore. That's why it's important to write as soon as you start doing research when everything is brand new, right? Because you're paying attention to everything. Toward the end, those notes will become more focused on the topic of your study. Don't be worried about making your field notes uh, seem too orderly. They can be chaotic. They can be subjective. They can be contradictory. You just want to be as descriptive as possible as you're doing your research. You want to try to write down all of your experiences. Some of you might be more visual. Your field notes can contain drawings, images, charts, diagrams. You just want to record your experience uh, to the greatest degree possible. Um, those field notes are going to provide much of the data over the course of your project or even over your career. Things, field notes that I took uh, when I was doing my dissertation in January of 2001, 21 years ago, I still go back to them now. Um, so yes, you will go back to your field notes over the course of a, a project or a career. Those notes should also contain emotional or psychological information about you and your own experiences because participant observation, as I said, it's so involved, so invested that your own frame of mind, how you're feeling, can really affect what you're witnessing, what you're observing, right? So when I was doing my dissertation research in this tiny little Kofan community, I had no control over what I ate, when I ate. I was super hungry. I was craving like the foods I was used to all the time. So then when I look at my field notes 
thankfully, I kept like a separate journal with my notes on how I was feeling. And I used that to like make, you know, to kind of, um, what's the word, calibrate what were in my technical field notes. I knew I was obsessing over food. So I was paying all this attention to like how much people ate the order in which people ate, what kind of portion sizes they got. Um, but maybe I was uh, paying attention to that so much, not because it was so important to people, but because it was so important to me because I was in this certain psychological, emotional, and bodily condition. So always try to reflect on yourself as you're reflecting on uh, the community you're trying to understand because you're gonna need both of those kinds of information to kind of judge and check your data. So here's just a picture of uh, basic field notes for me. I have the worst handwriting in the world. Um, I just pulled these out of my cabinet right back there, probably from a project that did maybe 2012. And I can't even read some of these things. They're almost like mnemonics. Who's TS? Who's DC? Who's D? Uh, AC, Alejandro Criollo, uh, October 2nd. What was, I, what was I writing down that he was saying? Like I said, my handwriting is impossible. And I'm going to say something about that in a second, which is also very important. Alejandro says that a dog uses its tail as a blowgun or as if it were a blowgun. That's why people cut off part of the tails of dogs to make them straight because a good bl good blowgun should be straight. I didn't go out that day thinking I'm going to ask Alejandro about uh, people's dogs and why people chop parts of the dog's tails off, but my God, he said it sounded relevant, so I'm going to write it down. But if I just went a year later trying to make sense of this, it wouldn't be enough information. So every day when you take field notes, I would have my laptop computer with me, whether I had power or not, I'd have a solar power, a solar panel, so I could have power where there's no electricity in the middle of the Amazon. And I had this FileMaker Pro database, a database program. And on this one from my current project, you can see this is a very recent field record, not a field note per se, July 6, 2022, in my current project on shamanism, I've got 99 topics. So there's a record number, there's a date, there's a whole set of topics, this incident. Um, this is actually an incident in which I was being cured uh, by somebody because I'd had a flare up of COVID-like symptoms. So I, all of the topics that seemed to pertain to this one incident I took field notes on. Who was participating? These three people, as well as me. Where was it happening, the location? And then some notes on this incident. So I would just in my little notebook, handwritten, have a few things written down before I could forget I go back to the computer, hopefully that night, if not that night, the next day, and I flesh it all out in beautiful typing so that I can read it 20 years later and make sense of it. And that's really where this data from participant observation lies in these field records, in this database program. Learning how to use database programs and set them up is itself a super important skill. And this is the kind of material, this, this is just a tiny part of a field note that was probably 10 pages long or something like this, a field record. I go back to this well after the fact, and I have thousands and thousands of these things at this point in time. Um, and there's an incident. Uh, I don't think I had a picture itself of that observation in that field record, but this is the guy, Jose Queta, who is curing me. And this actually is a still from video. Video is very important to my current project because much of it occurs at night in total darkness. So I have night vision on this video, set it up on a tripod, let it run, and then I can really see what's happening in real time and go back to these videos after the fact. Um, and in this video, you can see Jose, he's curing me, I'm sitting down there. Um, and that itself is what was happening in either that note I just showed you or other notes that I took after the fact. And in my current project, video recordings are super important, not only because it's dark and I get tired and these shamanic curing sessions last all night, but because I too am drinking hallucinogenic drugs and you're not doing a good job observing things when you're taking hallucinogenic drugs, ayahuasca or yahe for the kofan. So you need to make recordings. So making recordings is also extremely important, not just participant observation, not just field notes, not just field records, but using audio, video, and visual recordings uh, uh, to get data. 
So those interviews that I already talked about, those are extremely important research techniques and research data and material that you're going to use in any project or study that you do. Um, but then recordings of other kinds are also important for other reasons. You know, when you have so many photographs, you're going to take a lot of pictures in the field, right? Maybe video as well. It's going to provide raw, detailed, evocative data that you can use when your field work is done. And let's say I'm trying to write a great description of this individual. Well, there might be stuff in the field notes, but when I look at a picture of that person, how they look, what their house looks like, it's going to allow me to produce a very, very rich description. And if I have video, even more so. So video recordings allow you to observe activities after you participate them, to study them in more detail. Uh, in my shamanism project, I want to know, I mean, aside from the fact that I'm myself tired or hallucinating or being cured and have my eyes closed, I want to know every little word that shaman chants every little movement of the hands. Um, and that's something that you can only get when you have something recorded uh, video um, after the fact that you can go back to. And I actually, in my current project, not only videotape um, a shamans curing me and other Kofan people, I videotape myself watching those videos with the shamans after the fact. And they explain to me on the screen oh, this is what I'm doing there. This is what's happening there. And in that recording of myself watching a recording of another person who's in the recording, you get such rich data because they only think to explain things when they see themselves doing it. And I only think to ask certain questions when I am watching a recording with somebody else. So I have just as much video of me watching and talking about videos as I do of those videos themselves. And um, I think I might show you a little bit of the commentary uh, here that is being done in 2021 with Cesario Lusitante, the main shaman I'm working with right now. And we're talking about him chanting and explaining to me how he's chanting, what's happening in this, uh, what he's seeing. You'll see him make all these gestures and everything, pointing out the window. Uh, talking about, you know, we're in the national capital because of COVID. Um, and he's saying, you know, these spirits, it's like they're up on the hill over there. And the houses kind of look like that on that hill in the city, right? But they're different. They're all made of glass. It's beautiful. It's reflective. It's shining. It's not kind of dirty like it is over there. All of that visual information is so important. Um, so yeah, watch that for a second. もしきパーナバカニャカニャカニャアンガソンバイナ。ケイコカマンデイチョキアカサマケオバケシチュドトバチュアカニャバカクイクツチュアンガソンバイ。サイエツアパエナスクニャツアタエティエツアパインギアイ
of cultural anthropological research, which is basically based on participant observation as its most important method. This is extremely rich data that's being produced. You are up close, you're personal, you're witnessing events as they occur, uh, you're watching life as it's actually lived, your data is extremely, extremely detailed. Uh, you have validity in this data, in this research. You're watching these events as they occur in situ, which means in sight, in their natural context. You're not doing a survey, you're not just doing an interview after the fact, you're watching things happen as they happen in the context in which they normally happen. To me, that's the best means of accessing and depicting human life, right? You want to be there watching, participating, seeing people do things as they're doing them uh, in, the, in the normal context of their everyday life, right? Uh, that, is, that is how you get the best data about people. There are certain limitations. You got to get close. You may be biased. You can't stand back. You can't rest. But it's extremely rich data. What does that data allow, allow you to do? Uh, to understand things through interpretation. So because the observer is also a participant, they engage in that local behavior, they're really equipped to develop close, personal, intimate, complex relationships with the people they're working with so they can understand them really well, right? You get to know these people and the level of rapport or mutual understanding you can have uh, is not made possible by any other kind of scientific discipline in my mind, right? So if you have these great trusting relationships, um, you can understand things that other people cannot. Finally, another strength of participant observation research, cultural anthropology, it's cheap. <laughs> colleagues like uh, Dr. Hard, it's very easy for them to write million dollar grants with all these crazy amounts of equipment and teams. When I go into to do a project that might take a year, I need very little to do it. I need my notepads, my pen, my computer, a camera, maybe a video recorder. That doesn't take much money at all in the grand scheme of science. It'll take a lot of time, it'll take a lot of involvement, it'll take a, specific, a special kind of person who's able to do it, but it is very cheap uh, in the grand scheme of science to do this kind of research. So I had you read an article um, for this week about the kinds of skills and abilities that you get through cultural anthropology. And I actually wanted to read some of these because they're really important. Um, number one, social agility. Uh, in an unfamiliar social or career-related setting, you learn to size up quickly the rules of the game. Therefore, you can become accepted more quickly than you could without this anthropological skill. You're trained to be open, to enter new spaces, and to learn the rules of the game and throw yourself into them. That's what it means to be social agile. That's a good skill you have as a cultural anthropologist. What else do you learn? Powers of observation. You must often learn about a culture from within it, so you learn how to interview and observe as a participant. Very useful skill for all sorts of jobs. Planning is an important part of being a cultural anthropologist. You learn how to find patterns in the behavior of a cultural group. This awareness of patterns allows you to generalize about the behavior of the people in the group and to predict what they might do in a given situation such that you can plan for that situation. When I've done practical applied work, working for the Field Museum of Natural History, doing conservation work, I could say, we need to do, y'all wanna do something. I know exactly how to plan out the context and what people are gonna be comfortable with in that context because I've seen these kinds of patterns happen before. More skills and ability from cultural anthropology. Social sensitivity, this is obvious, right? While other people's ways of doing things may be different from your own, you learn the importance of events and conditions that have contributed to this difference. You also recognize that other cultures view your own ways as strange, right? Cultural relativism. You learn the value of behaving toward others with appropriate preparation, care, and understanding. So important, right? Once you learn that other people are different, they have diverse ways of doing things, those ways are totally valid, uh, logical to members, you're gonna be really sensitive uh, to negotiating diverse spaces, including diverse workspaces. Number five, accurate interpretation of behavior, what I just talked about a second ago. 
You become familiar with the range of behavior in different cultures. You learn how to look at cultural causes of behavior before assigning causes yourself. Interpret what people are doing according to their own frames of meaning or reference, not throw your own onto them. Six, predilection to challenging conclusions. You're good at challenging conclusions if you're a cultural anthropologist. You learn that analyses of human behavior are open to challenge. You learn how to use new knowledge to test past conclusions, right? You're so aware of difference and diversity and being open-minded that you are really good at not just accepting the way things are done in one community, but saying, there's a million different ways to do this, or at least three different ways, or I've got a new idea, I'm critically conscious of the situation because of my training as a cultural anthropologist. Number seven, insightful interpretation of information. You learn how to use data collected by others, recognizing or interpreting it to reach original conclusions. Pretty much related to what I said before about the importance of interpretation in cultural anthropology. Number eight, simplification of information. Because anthropology is conducted among publics as well as about them, you learn how to simplify technical information for communication to non-technical people. Um, that's important in many sciences. It's also important in cultural anthropology. You have this amazingly complex set of data. You need to communicate to that to people who don't belong to these communities. So you need to be able to spell it out clearly, excessively uh, in economical terms. Number nine, you're really good at contextualization. Although attention to details is a trait of anthropology, you learn that any given detail might not be as important as its context and can even be misleading when context is ignored. Participant observation, immersion, embedding yourself, context is everything. What may be okay in one setting is not okay in another setting you are really aware of the importance of setting or context as a cultural anthropologist. Problem solving. Often while functioning within a cultural group or acting on culturally sensitive issues, you learn to approach problems with care. Before acting, you learn how to identify the problem, set your goals, decide on the actions you'll take, and calculate possible effects on other people. I'm going to let you sit with that. I am going on too long, but obviously problem solving is something you should be good at as a cultural anthropologist. Writing. Writing is so important. Persuasive writing, another skill or ability. Anthropologists strive to represent the behavior of one group to another group and continually need to engage in interpretation, this word we keep coming up to. You learn the value of bringing someone else to share, of bringing someone else to share or at least to understand your view through written argument. How do you communicate those interpretations? Well, oral communication is important, but you'll be doing a lot of writing as a cultural anthropologist. And as Fareed Zakaria said in that video you all watched, becoming a good persuasive writer is so important in uh, the liberal arts and sciences, and that includes anthropology. You're translating different communities and cultures to each other. You're trying to persuade people to see things in a different way. To be a good cultural anthropologist is to be able to do that. You get that experience and training as a cultural anthropologist. Number 12, assumption of a social perspective. You learn how to perceive the acts of individuals and local groups as causes and effects of larger socio-cultural systems. This perception ena enables you to act locally and think globally. You might have somebody in your workplace and say, boy, that person does something really strange. But then you'll say, hmm, maybe it's something about the community or culture they're from. You can assign what look like uh, esoteric or exotic or bizarre uh, ways of speaking, thinking, acting, or feeling to cultural or social reasons. You assume a social or cultural perspective as a cultural anthropologist. That's your training, and you're good at it, and that's really important for getting anything done in a diverse world. And I also just like this list. Um, some skills developed in the anthropology major. Most of these are for cultural anthropology, but a few pertain also to archaeology. Working with a team, such as employment in an ethnographic or archaeological research team. Teamwork, so important, one of those basic competencies. Supervising a work team of peers. Policy making based on social science research data, problem solving methods, and professional ethical standards. Of course, you'll learn how to, you know, you'll, you'll become a subject matter expert and you'll be able to not only perform this research yourself, but turn to the research of others 
and bring it into any kind of project. Designing research pro projects and applying for grants, super important skills, right? This is why I always tell my students, if you want to really get the most of an anthropology degree, do your own independent study and independent project to show an employer that you know how to design a project, you know how to conduct a project, you get your own data, you analyze or interpret that data, you come up with conclusions. Man, there's no job in which that won't serve you well and in which it won't be in ext extremely um, persuasive or um, attractive to an employer. And to get grants to do this work, grant writing. A lot of my work uh, academically is about writing grants, but my non-academic work is about writing grants too. Producing a research paper in anthropological format and style, persuasive writing, we've talked about that. Orally presenting research results, not just writing, but speaking them. Using a variety of ethnographic data collection techniques, we've already talked about those. Uh, life history, ethnohistory, folklore, genealogies, everything cultural anthropologists do. Um, you might have experience uh, to work on a scholarly journal. You might become really good at editing. You can do that through anthropology. You can develop leadership skills, not just to lead a research team, but also to participate in professional organizations, even student organizations, right? We at, at UTSA, we have an, the Anthropology Society. We also have Lambda Alpha, the Honors Association of Anthropology. You become president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. That goes on your resume or CV. You've got leadership experience. Very important. Develop or enhance public relations for a museum. Well, that could be for archaeology or cultural anthropology, but once again, a skill you'll have. Design, build, install, and act as a docent for museum exhibits. I've done that as a cultural anthropologist. Archaeologists also do that. Maybe even biological anthropologists do that in natural history museums. Coaching, instructing, tutoring, and team teaching with pairs. Very general skills, but skills that come along with an anthropology major. Studying a second language. This is a big one. You don't have to go work in Ecuador or the Amazon to do cultural anthropology. You can do it anywhere. But often people interested in cultural anthropology are interested in diversity and difference, which does mean oftentimes going to another country, learning another language, like Spanish for me first, and then Kofan. But you could be going anywhere and doing that, speaking more than one language, being bilingual, trilingual, so important in today's world. Demonstrating sensitivity and perceptiveness toward another culture, so important. Um, inclusion, diversity, equity, these increasingly important terms in our world, in all sorts of jobs. Once again, uh, a, a key research or a key competency, as we've heard about, cultural anthropology is really good at developing that. So my academic work, I just want to see how long I've already been talking here, probably for a very long time. Uh, 40 minutes. Well, we'll see what happens here. Maybe I'll cut a lot of this out. Um, well, I work with Kofan people. I've been doing it for about 30 years. I do it every year if I can. I've lived in Kofan communities for more than five years at this point in time. Uh, academically, I've talked about that in my first little video. I've written three books. I've got two edited volumes coming out. I've got 15 peer-reviewed articles more underway, and I've got a lot of grants under my belt. Uh, I just have a little blurb here about what my research on the Kofan focuses with focuses on environmental issues, political issues, religious issues like shamanism. But I've also done a lot of work not for academic audiences. I call this popular work. I've contributed to four different documentary films. Um, I've uh, written an article and a photo essay for a popular magazine, Pacific Standard, not, not for academics. Um, I've done lots of interviews about my work uh, and provided expertise for other magazines, for newspapers, the Washington Post I was in, even for NPR, National Public Radio, because of my work as a cultural anthropologist. Um, I'm often consulted as an expert for writers doing popular books about anthropological topics. They may involve Kofan people or territory. They may involve things that I know a lot about, like the oil industry or Amazonia or indigenous politics but I do a lot of that consulting work, usually for free. Sometimes I get paid to do it. So my applied work, I've split it down into five separate areas here. Um, this is stuff that doesn't involve writing academic papers or writing academic grants or teaching. Uh, it's stuff that I do outside of that. And it all depends on my cultural anthropological skills. 
Um, and I split these into five main kind of non-academic applied kinds of work that I do, work that I could do for a living perhaps. I often, I've been offered jobs to do this stuff, but I decided to become a professor instead. First thing, I do so much of my activist work as the president of the Cofund Survival Fund, a nonprofit organization based in the States. I actually did used to get paid and work for the Field Museum of Natural History. Um, it's now the wing that, that does conservation work there is called the Color Science Action Center. It used to be called the Division for Environment, Culture, and Conservation. They offered me a job when I finished my PhD, but I decided to go academically instead. But now one of my students is doing the work that I probably would have been done doing there for full time. Um, I also write expert reports for various reasons and causes. I do amicus briefs for court cases. And I also do a lot of just random contingent personal support work for people that really depends upon my anthropological skills. So the Cofon Survival Fund, I have a whole, what I call a deck. Um, and I don't think I'm, I, I was ready to show it to you all in this, but I don't think I will, about all the projects that this nonprofit that I lead does in environmental conservation, in education, primary and secondary for Cofon people medical projects, land rights projects. We're doing a project now um, helping uh, to coordinate a project uh, 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 for, with COFAN women's organizations um, to develop uh, menstrual pads um, that are going to be really useful, economical, reusable for these women working with some allies in the States. All these different kinds of humanitarian and environmental projects that I do for the COFAN Survival Fund. There are so many practical skills and activities involved in this work of mine. Um, writing grants. Uh, we just got a $25,000 grant to, to get some COFON people working as park guards uh, to kick out some gold miners of an area. Gotta learn how to ask for money. Development work, once again, if you're, if you do, if you're good at grant writing and getting donations, you're gonna have a lot of career opportunities open to you. Um, I let people know what we're doing. So I uh, compose and distribute newsletters, hopefully monthly, often it goes longer than a month, but I'm good at that kind of written communication. Creating web content, we have a website, gotta maintain it, gotta put it up there. Uh, social media, another means of letting people know what we're up to through Facebook and through Instagram. This is an important professional skill for so many people. Leading and managing different kinds of teams. Well, I'm the president of the Cofund Survival Fund, but the president of the board of directors. So I'm the leader of that team, you know, eight or nine different people who all have different ideas about what should we, we should be doing as a nonprofit and what we shouldn't be doing. By the way, the Cofund Survival Fund, one of our main jobs is to advise and raise funds for the Fundacion Sobrevivencia Cofan, the Cofund Survival Foundation which is our Ecuadorian COFAN directed counterpart. They're the ones who are really doing so much of the work. We're providing them advice, insight, and most importantly, funding. Um, but sometimes we get really involved in those projects and the different little projects we work on, like this one I told you about working with women on uh, menstrual pads. Um, I as president and one of our other board members are setting up workshops, doing logistics, helping these people with the, all of our background knowledge of, of Kofan culture, how to do this, how to set it up, how to make it make sense. So you're leading these kinds of project teams too. Courting donors. Development work is not just about writing grants, but being nice to people with resources, uh, being compelling to them, using your oral uh, communication skills and your uh, writing emails in a persuasive way to say, hey, you want to help out? I was really happy last year. I did, wasn't even really trying, but I got a $100,000 grant for our work. Uh, so happy about that. Organizing trips and events, like I said, workshops, all sorts of things you got to put together doing nonprofit work. Um, all of that depends on cultural anthropological skills too. Database management. Well, I maintain a database of field notes, but I also maintain or at least work on and negotiate a database called Bloomerang, that's a database of our donors um, and how we communicate with them, how much they've given, what their level of activity with us is, you know, database management, important for so many jobs. All of those things involve cultural and linguistic translation because we are an organization that represents or supports or advocates for a group of people whose language, whose way of life is not understood by others. 
I've got to present all of that to people who are different, who can provide the resources, the connections, the networks, the political aid uh, to help those people out. Who can do that well aside from a cultural anthropologist? Really nobody. Another kind of applied or practical job that I've had is my work for the Field Museum of Natural History, which I talked about a second ago. And I, I think I'm going to show you a little bit video, a, a little bit of a, a video here. Um, one of the longest projects that's still ongoing. I mean, I worked for them and they paid me for a couple of years. Then I was an, a voluntary fellow for 10 years, but I still talk to people in the museum and work for them. They do so much conservation and indigenous uh, land rights work in, in Western Amazonia. I love the Field Museum. Um, one of the projects that started in 2007 with our doctoral student, Hugo Lusitante, was the COFON Historical Mapping Project. Um, so many practical sk skills involved in this, learning how to do video work, learning how to do GIS, you know, walk around with your GPS unit and get points, make maps, uh, editing, film production, creation of pedagogical materials. Uh, the whole point of this project is to map out COFON historical and cultural claims uh, to northeastern Ecuador. So I'm going to show you this little five minute video and it'll be funny. Chicago es un museo fuerte que con que vamos a un buen fa. Museo se inja a inde como fuerte. Tal vez es un fermentario más bermejo, dureno, sábado ni que en su fuerzón de que hace que inge ande más, ya me hinge chue. Es un buen fa que mapa ve. Ma que va mapa que política es un de que más cunda y. Gobierno que bupa, compañía petrolera que bupa, hasta segunda y. Mapa ni ya había falta y se han de ver inicio más de un chuma. Te ven va a te se chuye y se han de más. Son buenas escuelas a te sean que se te ven ver. Mapa, DVD, te ven ver. Investigación en zumba y a te sean de su grande que tú ya que a te sean son de que más. Paco ahí ande y a hacan fa. Cuando se han de que cuando sepa paña fa Paco inicio más a ingre. Paco con darse para más y su pangi, buña fa más que ande hincho ma. GPS con gui, más te va a te suye, india fa punto ve y suye. Paco en el tema hecho mangi y su pa can fa. Paco GPS punto ma, cania fa nyusia ma panga. Paco video y sian cho ma, canja fa. Y hinge cho ve y su pa, cha tu pa, nyunia fa fa inga nyusia ve. Nani chuma a fe y pui kan que su escuela nga tuya kan organización nga. Va proyecto ma se ma sende que a e su. Hugo Lusitante, estudiante. Profesor Martín Criollo. Aurelio Bustamante. Klaus Criollo. Estudiante Felipe Borman. Grigón de que su. Doctor Mike Zipek. Dan Brickmeyer, Dr. Clark Erickson, Sasha Samochina, Aaron Hoffman, R. Lee Beatley. Hinsa tuya shaka chu tansiyanya chu. Chigane fuite chu wengi ingefa shaka chu ma tansiyanya. Hukan inge fuese ata mapa video matsoni inha chu tsu. Bermejo tuya ken San Miguel, Colombia. Se facia andeni un bacani. Batsa y hingecho. Ande te voy a enjebe y suye. Va proyecto tatsa a inde. Saca si se paco te voy a enjebe a inge. Ta nyanda en que aña ta ingi un tic, tu je ingi ande, pa ingi aya, pa ne pieza, ne guiña ha, inja ya, mingue chati se llama chuanyo un guille. Tumbita tayo un tic, ya cani que haye fa ya. Ingit is a pangaya from Gafa, yet kept the Mahantu Shutachi Gafanus. 
Asak git fa yat asak ku ide ya fa fa. Sak kan su fa ya. Fa man kinya ha nyubi ye cu. All right, so that was the Kofan Historical Mapping Project. Also for the FEMA Museum, I worked on community conservation projects. They had all sorts of projects, um, trying to repopulate the river uh, with an enda two endangered species of river turtles, trying to help Kofan people make their own community conservation projects better. Field museum team would come, ecologists, zoologists, ornithologists, entomologists, these people are amazing scientists. Do they know anything about Kofan people or culture? Maybe if they spent time with them, but I as an anthropologist would often be translating linguistically from the Kofan language to English or Spanish and back and forth, but also culturally. Why to do things one way rather than another way? I can plan because I know those patterns of a different community and say, hey, this probably isn't gonna work, but if you do it this way, it might work. Um, also for uh, the Field Museum on those community conservation projects, we created a whole set of booklets, uh, training and documentation materials to show to the outside world, this is what Kofan people are doing. With these booklets, you can take these conservation projects, other communities can do them, can learn from them. So uh, there's visual materials there, there's written materials there, really important work. Oral communication and presentation skills at non-governmental and governmental meetings, oof, those are so important. Public persuasive speaking, uh, producing compelling PowerPoints. This one's not too compelling, it's too long. I've been in all sorts of meetings uh, with the Ecuadorian government, uh, with the Nature Conservancy, with big NGOs, trying to talk about why a, a Kofan conservation project or Kofan land rights are important or why they're justified. Speaking to high powered people, you need to be a good public speaker. You need to be able to read the room. You need to know how to set up a presentation to make that possible. Those are all things I did for the Field Museum, not for academic articles, but to get things done in the world. Expert reports and testimony, uh, serving as a court appointed or court involved expert on complex legal cases involving Kofan people and larger issues facing the residents and landscapes of Amazonia. Wow, that's a mouthful. I just wrote this this morning. This is like, no, no, this afternoon. I've got so much stuff going on right now that I had to put this together quickly. Some examples of expert reports and testimony. Um, I authored a report uh, for a lawsuit. This is not supposed to be super public information, so I won't say who was involved, uh, but um, someone, a government, was fumigating coca, cocaine crops, along the Colombian border, and Kofan people and other indigenous people and their territories were being hurt as a result. The government that was doing this saying, no, um, we're not hurting them because they are, they've already lost their culture, so they don't really depend on the forest anyways. So I got contacted as an expert and say, they say, give us a report that shows us how Kofan people have not lost their culture and really depend on the forest so that we can persuade an international body that they deserve compensation and this coca fumigation should stop. I did that, some other anthropologists did that and we won the case, it was great. Uh, I mentioned before, I think in my other lecture, serving as an expert witness for a Kofan couple who wanted to adopt a non-Kofan child through the Ecuadorian Ministry of Social Welfare, went into a court uh, in that Ecuadorian government branch and had to explain to these judges who know nothing about Kofan people who are probably racist against indigenous Amazonian people, why this non-Kofan child should be given to this Kofan couple, even though their culture looks different, they look poor, they look ignorant to these judges why that kid will have a good life if this adoption is approved and the adoption was approved and you know i'll take a little bit of credit for that i was very proud of that practical skills and in these expert reports expert testimony photography was very important in the first one uh technical writing uh very important in the first one it had to be accessible to public speaking very important in the second one deep knowledge of complex situations important in both Teamwork, uh, that first expert report, like I said, it wasn't just me. There were anthropological experts who work with neighboring peoples. We had to come together and produce this report with shared elements. 
Amicus briefs. Uh, these are what we call friends of the court briefs, producing legal documents for court cases involving Kofan people and territory. Definitely done one of those. I think I'm working on a second one now. An example, authoring a brief, a court brief, that argues that if Kofan territory is ecologically altered or destroyed, Kofan people and culture will suffer. Here's a picture of uh, Kofan people from the community of Sinangue. Uh, the Ecuadorian government decided to carve up their territory and territory around it so that mining companies could mine it. Um, and I was writing a brief for another non-governmental uh, organization called Amazon Frontlines, and they said, Mike, you're a Kofan expert. Write this brief that says if this land is destroyed, Kofan culture will be destroyed too. Uh, so I had to take all my knowledge and skills and expertise and experience and put that together into a compelling argument. We won that case. Those mining concessions were canceled. I probably played just a small part in that, but I was happy to be a part of it at all. Finally, personal and contingent support, the kind of applied work I do as a cultural anthropologist that things just happen all the time and I try to help people out. I probably could get employed by some nonprofit or, or a government to be this kind of like cultural attache, attache or something, helping certain groups of people in Ecuador, but this is something I do as a volunteer because I care about people. So my ethnographic knowledge and ability to negotiate the Ecuadorian legal, medical, and educational systems allows me to help co-fund people in difficult circumstances. Countless examples of how I've done this. So many people I've helped out with medical emergencies. They can't speak the language, can't talk to the doctors. They can't explain how their own medical beliefs are manifesting in this symptom. So I go into the hospital, I go into the doctor's office, I talk to the doctors and kind of try to serve as a translator and help people explain their problems to get the care they deserve and actually to access that care, right? I got to use my privilege as a gringo who can speak Spanish and English as a U.S. citizen to bust in there and say, help out these people. Um, help with educational challenges. I've helped so many Kofan students, uh, primary school, college, high school, and now at the doctoral level. And a lot of that also depends on, you know, having a lot of background knowledge in their culture and why it presents certain advantages and disadvantages for succeeding in school. Help with activist events and projects. Um, I've helped Kofan people in many ways uh, with that. Uh, the Kofan were involved in a national indigenous uprising and strike this past summer. Uh, a Kofan leader was a member of the um, national indigenous organization. And I said, hey, not enough people know why you're doing this national strike. Let's do an interview in Kofan. I'll ask questions and uh, you speak in Kofan and then I'll subtitle it in both Spanish and English. Maybe I'll show you a little bit of that. We'll see. All right. Maybe I did or didn't. Um, and then we put that interview up on YouTube and all these people saw it and they're like, oh yeah, now we know why these people are doing this. We support this cause. Um, help with nominating Kofan leaders for awards. I've done that work before. Um, we just had two Kofan activists, a man and a woman, who won the Goldman Environmental Prize. Was that this year or last year? I forget. But I was involved in uh, the first round for that, uh, talking to people uh, at that organization, um, saying why these individuals are so important in their culture, why their social and, co and political struggles are so important, and uh, just treasured the ability to help nominate um, and uh, justify awards, recognition, resources for indigenous activists, students, anything. Uh, my contacts with other NGOs also helped me to do all of that kind of medical, educational, and political work. When you stick around doing this kind of activist work and advocacy work for a long time, you make a lot of allies. Not one organization can do everything, so you need this professional network. All of that work involves my cultural anthropological skills, but it also depends on the deep levels of trust confidence and goodwill long-term ethnographic field work can produce to figure out how people are feeling what their challenges are what they really want you need to know them you need that participant observation over a long time you need that level of rapport and intimacy and trust to be the most effective advocate you can be for those people that's something cultural anthropologists can do a lot of other people have hard time doing it because they don't have that deep level of trust and knowledge that we do. All right, I'm gonna end it there. Hopefully this didn't freeze up. I was gonna go through a whole other thing about the Kofan Survival Fund, but I'm sure this is already 
more than an hour. Let's see. Oh, less than an hour, 58 minutes. You gotta watch it all. You're gonna have a quiz on this, folks. So uh, have fun. Maybe I'll edit it down. We'll see, but uh, we'll talk to you soon.